This is John Harper of Exclusive Scottish Visits. And I'm very excited this morning because I'm at the Highland Chocolatier and I'm going to be meeting a man called Ian Burnett. And this is actually welcome to the home of the world's best chocolate. And Ian is going to give me a tasting. Now, I'm a chocolateholic, so I'm very excited about this prospect. So come inside and let's have a look at this wonderful chocolatier and let's look at the tasting. Thank you. Well, welcome, John. Thank you for coming. Um, so, I'll start from the beginning just to give you an intro to uh, Ian Burnett, Highland Chocolatier, what uh, I do, and so on. Uh, what, what have you heard about what I do so far? Well, I, I hear you're the best of the best, and I'm delighted to say I've tasted your chocolates um, in a number of places around Scotland, yeah. the very upmarket places, especially the um, Dalwhinnie Distillery. I, I've right. actually had a wee dram there. Yeah. No, really, I'm a truffle or ganache specialist. This is where you are combining cream, fresh cream, and fruit with chocolate. Uh, and you know you can infuse spices and so on but the velvet truffle is really the specialty and uh, that's received over 40 international awards now right uh, the way through to um, the best food service product in scotland and uh, but also the best truffle in the world at the international chocolate awards and those awards are really down to um, you've got really lovely ingredients that's a key part obviously and we'll talk more about the cocoa and the chocolate um, but also the, the fresh cream and the fruit uh, and the, the honey and so on that we get from the local apiaries here but uh, the other side is how we make it um, and that is uh, more of a french style um, and uh, you, I guess there's, there's two ways you can make truffles or chocolates. You can, if you look up here on the shelf, you'll see on the, t on the top right there, uh, polycarbonate mold. So one way of making chocolates is you have a, a mold with some cavities in it um, and you fill that with chocolate, empty it out and you're left with a kind of a shell. You put something in that shell and something soft and squishy, top it off, knock it out, you have your heart-shaped chocolate. But the problem with that is that to get the chocolate shell out of the mold, it has to be quite thick. Yes. If it's very thin, it just gets stuck in there. So by its very nature, if you've got something very delicate like the velvet truffle, yep. a molded chocolate means you're going to have to have like a gobstopper, kind of something heavy you've got to bite through. Yeah. So that's why we work more with the French style. This is where you're, you, um, you sort of work on a weekly cycle. So once the fresh ingredients come in on a Monday, uh, we then infuse the cream or the fruit with spices and we begin the crystallization process. Uh, it takes about three, two to three days um, to make the truffles. You wow. can make, I know you can make a truffle in, a, in half an hour in your kitchen, yeah. you know, you take some cream, you mix it up with some chocolate and roll it around, there you go. But if you want the consistency that yeah. you know, most of the velvet truffles are going to uh, Michelin star chefs, Gordon Ramsay, Albert Roux, uh, mostly in the UK, but some you know North America and Northern Europe and even Japan we do some export too. But the reason they're taking those truffles is because partly because of what they don't have in them. Yeah. You know, even hand making chocolatiers are going to put you know glucose, sorbitol, yep. um, various additives in order to keep that truffle squishy and soft yep. and so on. But it takes away the flavour. But how, how do you get away with not putting those additives in? To it's the the that's where the time comes in. So okay. the velvet truffle originally took about um, just almost three years to develop. Um, and that's about 140, 150 different variations, not just to the recipe, but also to the method. But it's a bit like a, a, a bell curve, you know, you'll have, um, you know, for a little while your chocolate's not quite ready. You might make a few chocolates, but it's not, yeah. it's not ideal. But hey, they're chocolates, everyone likes chocolates, right? <laughs> You get to the top of the bell curve and yeah. you get this, it's perfect. Yes. But then this is a crystal, uh, a dynamic crystallization. Mm -hmm. So after a while, that sort of pot of chocolate, if you like, begins to over crystallize or decrystallize. Mm -hmm. So some of your chocolates aren't so good anymore. So but the problem, therefore, is that you are, if you're working with a fixed mass of mm -hmm. chocolate, how do you retain the quality? Yeah. Because what we can't do for a Michelin chef is give him 99 fantastic chocolates and one, yeah. eh, so so. They all have <laughs> to be spot on. Yeah. You know, that's why they come and ask because yeah. you know they have trouble with temperatures and conditions and, uh, and and skills in their kitchen. So, so what you're looking at here, these are like Mercedes Benzes of the chocolate yeah, world. Yeah. So if you think of that um, that uh, marble slab that was cooling the chocolate, at the back of this uh, equipment is like a an Archimedes screw right. or a propeller which is going up the back, which is refrigerated. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> uh, so we've got a few of the chocolatiers running around just now. <laughs> um, 
So that Archimedes screw is crystallizing, moving, and tempering, if you like, crystallizing the chocolate. Once the machine gets into balance, it gives us a tap um, of chocolate right at the top of that bell curve because the chocolate is then drops into the bowl and is completely melted again. Right. So what you're getting out uh, on tap, as it were, is freshly crystallized, perfectly crystallized um, chocolate. Uh -huh. So that's that's about the crystallization of the chocolate. So this is what all chocolatiers uh, are. And is there a waste? I mean, the, when it is anything that it drops depends. out. If you haven't mixed anything with uh -huh. it, no. Okay. No, um, I just I'm just thinking for myself as a, a chocoholic. If you've got any waste, I'll give you my address, and could you just send, well, send, send the spare chocolate? Well, I do to need me. tasters occasionally, but, well. but the, the, the key, and you're going to find this later, the key to tasting is honesty. Okay. Because you've got to say, listen, that's terrible. Yeah. Or you've got to be able to say, I don't taste anything. Yeah. Or, yeah. You know? so, um, so that's the crystallization of pure couverture chocolate. Now, truffles make this exponentially more complicated because you've been crystallizing the cocoa butter, the, the fat, if you like, from the cocoa bean. If you then combine that in a truffle with dairy butter, so fresh cream, mm -hmm. your problems just multiply because you've then got two uh, different crystalline uh, crystallizations which are going to have an impact um, based on humidity, temperature, movement, all kinds of um, uh, different aspects come into play. So your average chocolatier is going to put in the glucose, the sorbitol, mm, the, right. the vegetable fats to make it soft and squishy and not yeah. dry out and okay. give you that texture you think you're looking for for mm. a soft truffle. So that's what we spend the time doing. Right. That's why it takes your two, three days is because right. we're um, doing it slowly and naturally mm. rather than putting in an additive in order to achieve the system. Yes. And it's not because I'm a purist, it's simply because you're going to taste more. Yes. If you don't have the additives in, you're going to taste more. Um, and you'll find that with the cream. I use cream from a particular herd of mm. Frisian cows across um, the valley and that, you wouldn't notice that difference if you had the additives in there. So right. without the additives, you taste more. Anyway, we're talking too much about tasting. Yeah, do it. yeah. Do it. Mouth, mouth watering already. I'll, I'll, I'll take you through to the um, the wee exhibition where you can That's see great. a bit more. Thank you. The first thing about cocoa is that you're having to um, you can't plant fields on it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it has to grow underneath other trees. So therefore, it usually grows in about 15 degrees of the equator, often around rainforest and so on. But that means you have small holders. It's really because there's people living yes. in, in, this, in these yes. areas. Uh, it's a very um, delicate plant as well, so it's got some, you know, it requires a lot of care. Um, so after it's been harvested, you then have it fermented. So you're seeing inside, it's kind of like a mango stein, it's very sort of sweet, yes. uh, damp kind of pith it has. So here you're seeing it underneath uh, banana leaves being mm. fermented, it can be in a wooden boat box. Um, but the key thing is to bring out the flavour. So the fermentation is the first stage, which is trying to release some of the flavours that are in there. Yes. It's using natural um, bacteria in the area. So, you know, one, one farm's, uh, you know, bacteria, if you like, but the fermentation was going to make it taste different from another farm and so on. So you have a lot of variation. Yeah. If you let it go too long, more than about three days or so, it's going to start to go vinegary. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so you've got to get the flavour out, but not go too far. Yeah. Um, after that is the drying process. So again, ideally it should be sun dried, should be turned over um, to make sure it's you know evenly dried, not too much again, yes. you need some of the moisture. But if you have bad weather, if yeah. um, a farmer decides to light a little fire under there, <laughs> get it there quicker, you're gonna taste that yep. uh, later. This is the point at which it's usually shipped abroad. They usually get graded and shipped because the next stage is roasting and that mm. takes um, a lot um, of uh, more industrial yeah. process. So not, not done uh, by the farmers themselves, it's special. No, exactly. Yeah. Usually they form, will form cooperatives and so yeah. on to yeah. get it graded and shipped, but at that point it's usually passing to a, a producer, a manufacturer, someone who's got the equipment because uh, you start working on pieces of equipment the size of this room and yeah. there are more and more some of the producing, uh, growing countries are, are have this equipment. But, yes. Uh, it's more more rare. Um, so after that, it's the, the next stage is the roasting. Wow. So for, my, for myself, the beans are roasted in their skins. They're kind of like a broad bean. If you look uh, here, you'll see some which are being roasted. They've got like a, a thin shell on the outside. Yeah. So um, for me, this is being done in Belgium, but they're uh, roasted and then winnowed to get rid of the shell. When you slightly crush the inner bean, it fragments just like this into cocoa nibs. Uh -huh. You might have seen these, it's getting more popular even in you know, the shops, you can buy some cocoa nibs. Um, 
this, if you crush this further, it liquidizes because it's about 50% fat, cold yes. butter. So then you have you sieve that and you have your should be a red mass. You know, supermarkets <laughs> be kind of like beige or brown, a bit over processed. But you've either got um, the cocoa mass, this kind of red mass, yep. cocoa powder to, yep. to most people, um, or cocoa butter. So this is where you start your recipe. You take a certain amount of cocoa butter, a certain amount of cocoa mass, sugar, and then you start your recipe. Um, so obviously you, you fight off the cosmetics industry for the cocoa butter, mm -hmm. everybody wants that. But um, uh, that final stage um, is conching. So the conching is a critical stage where you're doing two things. One is you're reducing the particle size. You're trying to get it below about 30 microns so you don't taste any of the graininess but you're also trying to release that flavor. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine if you don't conch enough, if you don't um, uh, grind, if you like, enough, you're, you're not going to release the flavors. They'll be locked in there. The chocolate will be fairly bland. Yeah. If you overdo it, and we're talking about um, often 24 hours, mm -hmm. you know, a short one is maybe 12, 18 hours, mm -hmm. up to maybe 30 hours or so. If you conch too far, you kill the flavor. But by conching, what are you doing? You're so this is, imagine a big water-cooled rollers, because yeah. you, you mustn't let it heat up. You're yes. grinding yes. very finely, which is going to create heat, right. but water cooling is going to keep that temperature down, prevent. You're trying to release the volatiles you don't want, mm -hmm. and uh, but retain the flavor aromas yeah. that you do want. Yeah. So it's a bit of a balancing act, yeah. um, but that's that's the conching for you. But that's a, a real art form in itself, because yeah. yeah. you can imagine, doesn't matter how these other steps have gone, if you can't over conch yes. or you don't conch enough, yeah. that flavor is locked in there. So um, so I'll just take you up um, to see the final yes. product. Well, here is Seventh Heaven here. So we didn't, you know, we didn't actually talk too much about the Velvet Truffle itself, because we'll, we'll taste it more. But it, um, when you have that texture, remember I was talking that it takes us two plus days to mm. actually get that wonderful crystallized texture. Yes. Um, if you get it just right, you can have it pure if you want. I feel like a cake, so yep. it's naked. It has no chocolate covering at all. So what you're seeing here is um, uh, dusted with cocoa powder, white chocolate powder, could be fruit powder like mango or raspberry powder. And this is, you can have it with a little truffle fork. It's literally um, like a, a little piece of cake and that is lovely because it just dissolves in your palate. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, Quite, quite fun, exciting. But it looks kind of boring, but tastes yeah, It looks lovely, <laughs> it looks so, lovely. But uh, if you see it with, um, enrobed, or that's where we pass it through a thin waterfall of chocolate, uh -huh. vibrate it at a certain frequency to make the chocolate a bit like sand at the beach. If you shake yes. it a little bit, it becomes thinner. Yes. And below the excess off, you end up with a very delicate paper thin layer. Uh -huh. And then you can do a little bit of decoration. So that's what you're seeing here, yes. are some uh, cocoa butter um, mixed with food coloring transfers uh, transferred onto the tops of the yeah. chocolate. I recognize these chocolates because uh, I visit Dalwini Distillery yes. quite regularly and I've had a tasting with, with a tasting of chocolate as well. Sure. It goes together beautifully. It does. It's really interesting. Um, I mean, I could talk for hours about Santomi, but um, right, you're, you're a chocolatier in Scotland, so yeah. first question I got asked, oh great, will you do us your whiskey truffle? And I was like, listen, <laughs> will you give me your £500 bottle of malt? Let me pour about hot chocolate in the top. You'd be like, no, it's the same. <laughs> yeah. If you have chocolates which are really delicate, go these amazing flavors, the last thing you want to do is kill it with yeah. some alcohol. Yeah. But I said to them, listen, I'll do what I do with the chefs. Is if you've got a certain menu, if you've got a certain expression of whiskey or um, a spirit, then we can pair these in a way that's not a marketing gimmick. It's not like let's have cheese this month and chocolate next month. Yeah. If you do it right, so the, the massive distiller or the nose are, are, is often I don't know, let's say there's a hint of um, <clears throat> uh, clove in their, in their whiskies, and they would really love people to appreciate that. The average person will know that whiskey, they might get like a, a fruity note, but they kind of miss the spice. Mm. If you pair it very carefully with the right kind of, uh, again, the velvet truffle, which is going to disappear in your palate, you'll nose the whiskey, you'll taste the chocolate. When you come back to the whiskey, it's like a head full of yeah. clothes. It's extraordinary. Yeah. Yeah. So if you get it right, it gets really, I mean, it's exciting for the distiller because yeah. they get to bring out those characteristics that people often miss. It's exciting for me because it happens in reverse too. The, the chocolate I think I know so well shifts based because the, the, the whiskey can also open up the back of your palate. Yes, yes. So yeah, that's really exciting. Yeah. And so it's gone from like, no, 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 can't do whiskey truffles to actually really exciting. Uh, yeah. So Delwini do it very well. I think it's, it's kind of interesting as uh, candied fruits. This country has a terrible history of glassy fruits, which are like crusted with yes. sugar and blue and green and taste like yeah. the cardboard box they come in. Yeah. 
These are heated up each day to a slightly higher temperature for about seven to eight days. The idea is by osmosis, you're bringing the sugar through the skin of the fruit into preserve the fruit. But the clementines are a good example. If you cut open that clementine, the juice of the clementine comes out. Yep. So that, and that tastes like a clementine, it has the texture and the flesh of the clementine. Obviously, it's got the, the sugar to preserve it, yep. but it has the flavor, the texture of the, of the original fruit. Um, so that's really fun. You can do that with ginger and yep. it becomes very fiery as well. Okay, you ready to taste? Oh, yes, I yeah. think I am ready to taste. <laughs> let's go, let's go. <laughs> Hello, this is John Harbour again from Exclusive Scottish Visits and I've thoroughly enjoyed a short tour around this wonderful chocolatier, the Highland Chocolatier and I'm delighted to say that I'm with Ian Burnett who's given us a, a wee tour of the premises and now he's given me the absolute delight of tasting some of his wonderful chocolates. So Ian, I'll hand over to you to uh, let me get started. Yeah, we've done a lot of talking so this is the, this yeah, is the this fun is part. The good bit. Okay. So, um, now, have you done a, a chocolate tasting before? No, I haven't. Uh, no? I've done many whiskey tastings, but right? not chocolate tastings. Well, it's, it's, there, it's not like uh, you, you get it right or you get it wrong. It's, it's not a test. It's going to be a bit of fun. But uh, what you'll find will be slightly helpful is if you, when you bite the chocolate, and this is particularly on the first one, the first one is solid uh, mm -hmm. Saotome uh, couverture. Take a, when you take a bite of that one, you want to crush it with your teeth, let it warm up a little bit on your tongue. Mm. And the trick is, to try to breathe with an open mouth, slightly open mouth. So okay. with your lips slightly apart, you're going to breathe in and that just helps circulate and you just taste a lot more that way. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so that's the trick. Let right. it warm up, crush right. it, let it warm up and then breathe in to try and let that aroma circulate. Right. Okay, right. but you, people taste all different things. Okay. Um, particularly, uh, it depends what you've had for breakfast this morning. Um, <laughs> Muesli. Uh, music, <laughs> coffee. No, I didn't. Good, I good. Didn't. Coffee is a killer. <laughs> oh, right, okay, good. <laughs> I always, with these Michelin chefs I serve, they always want to do it as a petit four after coffee. Yeah. Your palate's shot after like three course <laughs> meal and coffee. So, yeah. uh, no, actually the best time to taste is first thing in the morning before right. your breakfast. Right. So keep it under your bed, 18 degrees, that's the right temperature. Okay. Babies and chocolates, just that's the temperature. <laughs> but that's when you'll actually taste a lot more. So right. you're in a pretty good, we're pretty good. We're well, early morning, so yep. we're, we're good. Um, yep. So try that long de chat first. This long de chat is like a cat's tongue. Long de chat. Traditionally an Eastern European biscuit, but yeah, it's a nice way to taste ah. uh, a piece of chocolate. So take a bite of that and see what you think. Let it crush it, let it warm up, and then try to do that breathing and see what you get. Wow. Mm. Mm. I, I, did, I think I declared at the beginning I'm a chocoholic. <coughs> <coughs> so how does that compare to other? Oh, that's just divine. Mm. It's, it's really cocoa flavors coming through as well. Yeah, it's a very intense cocoa, mm. the Saotome. As a truffle specialist, I need something uh, strong to push through the cream. Mm. So you get a lot of intensity. Uh, do you get any, what do you get in terms of sweetness? Well, on the front of the tongue, I'm getting quite a bit of sweetness just it's to the back of the tongue. Well, I'm t really tasting more the cocoa. The savory, it's yeah. more of the flavor. It's, and as you see, as I'm breathing in, I'm. It's all developing. It's well, quite long, isn't it? Oh. There's so many things happen. <laughs> it's quite hard to explain. Yeah. So, I mean, you taste, people no. taste all different things, you know, but um, you tend to get the sweeter notes at the beginning. Yeah. You tend to yes. get sweeter fruity, but as you've just been just trying to mm. describe, it's like as it's it almost moves like a on, sweet bark. Yeah, because it moves on, you get almost like a woody note at yes, the end. Yes, and yes. somewhere before that, there's a sort of a peppery, mm. you know, there's a kind of warm spices mm. uh, in it as well. Yeah. But how about the texture? How do you find the texture? Well, you're right. Um, biting in and of course I normally just bite, chew as much as I can, get a bit of flavour and swallow. I've, I've let this linger and it's wonderful but yeah. it, it's actually as you say it's hard mm -hmm. so you really got to let it melt a bit yeah. on your mouth to yeah. get the true the true flavour, let That's all right. the flavours come through. They're delicious. That's delicious. where that conching comes in and the crystallisation if you've done that really well mm. you're going to, it's going to dissolve quite easily on your palate mm. but it's you're going to get more of the flavor so we've tasted the saotome that's about 71 72 percent cocoa um which is interesting because a lot of people have a dark chocolate about 40 percent find it very bitter this has half that sugar but yet it's more sweet yeah and that is simply down to how it's looked after if you grow tomatoes at home why is it sweeter than what you buy in the supermarket yeah. you, you know with the a big anti-sugar drive at the moment uh, the, the sugar government. tax yes. yeah the yeah. sugar tax i mean yeah can can the government somehow 
uh, buy into this with a view to reducing I, I the sugar level, the but people, allowing people still to eat chocolate? Absolutely. There was a, I was doing this with a diabetic yesterday, right. and um, what they need to know is how much sugar is in something. So, and obviously, if you've got something that's lower in sugar, it's always going to be better. Yeah. You know, sugar is generally used as a cheap um, addictive substance as opposed to like uh, a balancing agent. <laughs> yeah. um, so if you've got something very sweet, a sweet cocoa that's been really well looked after, mm-hmm. not heavily processed, it not only does it taste better and needs less sugar, but also it's got more nutrients. The, the, generally speaking, in, in nature, the better something tastes, yeah. the more natural that yeah. is, the better it tastes, the more nutrients. And that's okay. the same with the dark chocolate. Well, well my mouth's watering again, so what's Okay, <laughs> so what we're going to do is we're going to take some of this Sautome dark chocolate. Okay. We're going to combine that with a very special cream. Okay, so truffle specialist, probably the... 50% of the ingredients, the key thing for me is the fresh cream. Yeah. So we did a blind tasting of cream. Uh, you know, one end of the scale is a cream that tasted like sour milk. That's your fresh cream that you buy in the supermarket. It's just a blended cream. Yeah. At the other end of the scale, there was this cream that tasted like, you know, Greek yogurt with honey in it. Really, um, just like if, if you've ever chewed on a piece of green grass, yeah. you know, that kind of sweetness you get yes. from the grass, it's literally in that cream. Because there's no additives, there's nothing else in here, so there's no sorbitol, glucose, yes. you're just tasting the dairy and the cocoa, nothing else. Um, now this is unenrobed, so this is another lovely thing about the velvet truffle. That Could you just explain robed and unenrobed? Yeah, so unenrobed, uh, often you can make a molded chocolate, we were talking about at the beginning, where you have this thing encapsulated in a thick layer of chocolate. Right, okay. That's where you start with the outside and put something squishy on the inside. The velvet truffles are made inside first, so we, we create a very carefully balanced crystallized ganache. Yes. Now this you can leave as is, like a, a piece of cake if you like, naked truffle, an unenrobed truffle with no covering. Mm-hmm. Um, that's what you're about to taste. Okay. Or you can, like the other chocolates in front of you, uh, enrobe them in a very delicate layer. That's where you pass them through a waterfall yes, of chocolate. Yes, I can see the difference. delicate layer on the outside. Yeah. Um, just to give them other flavours. Right. Um, so so you, want, you want me to bite into Try this. this. Now this okay. was awarded best dark truffle in the world. Oh, okay? well, well, wow. So, no pressure. No, no but, pressure, yeah. but what's interesting is it's got a lot of dark curvature in there. Right. So there's a lot of cocoa, but you're getting cream. Uh, so oh. let's see what you get. Mmm. The creaminess just comes right through. Is that the flavour oh, or the, the texture? F- well, the creamy texture. Yeah. I'm getting real, I mean, it's almost like a, a coffee bean in my mouth. Yeah, there's a lot of cocoa there, mm. isn't there? Yeah. Sweet. Delicious. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I'm just so excited, it's difficult to describe it, but uh, no, it's, it's um, once again, it's not so barky as the last one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that cream is making it more mild. Yeah. This, this is... It's a little bit peppery at the back. Yes, exactly. You're still going to get those spices from the yeah. Sautome. Now, this is the dark velvet truffle. Those mm. obviously milder. I'm going to have to try the other bit. You, you should course, probably yeah. use that up. <laughs> um, but it does... It, it's, it, I'm glad you like dark chocolate because mm. this is a, a really dark one. It's not bitter again. No, it's, it's just not. intense. Mm. Yeah. And you're getting a lot of the cocoa, a lot of mm. the, the, the spicy notes mm. from it. Um, but... Uh, there's a mild version of this as well, I do. Right. Uh, well, I mean, I, I'm a dark chocolate lover anyway. Good. And that is just superb. Um, and the thing is, when you go to the supermarket to buy a, an 80% dark chocolate, you've really got to put up with a real bitterness. I know. That I know. was superb. It's really interesting, isn't yeah. it? If you have um, uh, a good, well looked after bean, it's going yes. to taste better. Yes. The, the, um, I mean, from this point, that's like a building block. We can add in spices to that. There's one I do where um, we, you know, we use Assam tea leaves and uh, green cardamoms, and you can create a lovely sort of Indian spice infusion. Yep. Um, but that's that's the starting point. Yeah. Um, and Delicious. because it's cocoa butter, again, there's not... If there was glucose or sorbitol, other sugars or fats added, it would become slightly more... Uh, cloying, it wouldn't melt. Because it's just cocoa butter, it's going to disappear on your palate. So you don't have a waxy, heavy feeling, yeah. but you get more flavor, yeah. and that's the key. Yeah. As it dissolves, you, you taste more. Mm, so. that, that's definitely just what, what happened there. Okay, so we're going we're gonna to move on to a okay. fruit-based truffle. So okay. we had the cream-based one. Uh-huh. Next one is going to be a slightly different texture because of the natural fructose in the fruit. Uh-huh. And you've got to tell me what's in it. Okay. Okay. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, it's not, it's not going to... I'm not getting away with this slightly. No, no, you're going to have to tell me. No, it's not a test. It's really just to see there's a fruit and a spice in there. <clears throat> Very connected to the Sautome curvature, actually. Mm. Mm. Now, you might get the spice first or the fruit I'm getting first? the spice. Spice first, mm-hmm. okay. What does it taste like? It's almost a rosemary. I 
I'm, I'm tasting rosemary. <coughs> it's quite aromatic. Mm. It's more of a, a warmer smell. A raspberry coming through. Yep, so you've got the fruit, so that's mm. crushed raspberries. Mm -hmm. What's that spice? I mean, it's rosemary that's hitting me. Not, not a strong one, sort of mm. mild, but, but definitely. That's maybe because it's an aromatic. Is that, right. it's, it's a black pepper. Right. But it's quite a warm aromatic one. It's not a hot mm -hmm. black pepper. Mm -hmm. So you're, that, I can see where that's coming from. Yeah. But what's lovely about this one is that oh um, yeah, I'm getting the pepper now. It's coming now. It's just coming. See, now. people get at different stages. Yeah. You know, so, that's so like, like I got a herb, yeah. then very much the raspberry the came raspberry. through, and just the and black, now you're black left pepper. With the pepper. Yeah. What's lovely, you know, we were talking about the Sautome has the kind of a red fruit note to it. It mm. has a peppery, a warm spice note. If you take a couverture which has these notes and you then combine it with real crushed raspberries and black pepper, mm. the flavor you get is just really full. And, yes. and it's, that's really lovely. This one an Academy of Chocolate Award, largely I think because of that, because it's got this, um, it's building on a couverture which has the right characteristics. Yes, yeah. yeah, it looks beautiful as well. Who, who, do, who do the designs? Who, who draws on these? Uh, that's uh, complicated. It's a silk screen printing, okay. really. Beautiful. So you're, you're basically using cocoa butter as your base um, uh -huh. and food coloring, and then you, 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 you layer it up with a silk screen print system. Wonderful. Um, so this is, this is a more of a dark one again. Okay. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to go more milk, there's like yep. a, I do one with strawberries and star anise. Okay. Strawberries, when you cook them, don't have a strong flavor, so the star anise kind of boosts that. Right. Um, okay, so you're on, do you like white chocolate? I do. Yeah? I prefer the, the, the black but white chocolate, obviously. Well, yeah. This is an interesting one. Most white chocolate, you get a lot of sugar and yes. um, uh, very sweet and very milky. You say white the, chocolate. It's, yeah, it's inside, inside's coming. Okay, okay, okay. But the white chocolate I use has got um, a lot more cocoa butter. So that's the expensive part, yep. but therefore less sugar. So this is really, for me, a carrier. I wanted to make a, a fruit-based, um, a, a really fruity ganache. Yeah. So this has got two fruits in it. Have a bite and tell me what are the two fruits. Okay. Okay. Prepare. It should give you warm water, actually. Yeah. yeah. I'm just in the seventh heaven now. <laughs> Not minding what fruits. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Mm. I'm almost hit by a lemon as soon as. Yeah, it's very citrusy. So that what was one of the goals was to make something really, mm. you know, with a high fruit note. So it's a very citric fruit. Mm, it is, isn't it? But, uh, more I'm getting an orange now. Mm -hmm. It's actually gone from lemon to a nice, almost tangerine. Mm -hmm. Go more exotic. I mean, funnily enough, we tried well, everything, calamansi, Japanese yuzu, pink grapefruit, all sorts of things. But well, believe it or not, a bit of pineapple Yeah, is coming know, through. I would say pineapple in this yeah. one because when you take these two fruits, um, and combine them, there is this, it just tastes like pineapple. Yeah. Because pineapple has a sharp citrus, but a very round flavor. So for the sharp citrus in this one, it's passion fruit, actually. Ah. It's, um, it's crushed passion fruit. Mm. But if you just had passion fruit, it would be like, woo, very sharp and yes. shocking. Mm. But it would be quite like a one-hit wonder. Yes. Whereas the mango, there's a mango added to it as well. It, of course, yeah. it gives you the roundness of the flavor. Mm. So you have this, um, you know, two sides to the flavor profile, mm. if you like, which makes it sharp and wow, but yeah. also a bigger flavor. No, that, that I, I can taste the. It's fun. It is, fun, isn't, isn't it? it? Mm. And the dark chocolate on the outside is just balancing that, Beautiful. so it's not too Beautiful. sweet. And that's you can actually see the the white chocolate in the middle there. Yeah. So that yeah. would have confused me. I know. I told you so. <laughs> You're even gonna have a milk chocolate in a minute, but that, there you go. <laughs> we'll have them all, but the. There's, um, you can do different things with this. Um, there's, uh, uh, I do one that's crushed limes uh, with a bit of cayenne chili. Uh -huh. And that one's much uh, sort of fresher if you want. But, uh, and the cayenne, you get a hit from the lime and then you get a little bit of cayenne at the back of your throat. It's not a hot chili, but yep. it's more of a, a warm tingling. And that's fun as well, if you like white chocolate. Yes, yes. Okay. So the last one uh -huh. is different again. Now this is a praline or right. a jandouille, Jean Duja. Um, this is where you take hazelnuts mm -hmm. and combine it with uh, milk chocolate in this case. Right. Um, so very interesting milk chocolate that I use. It's got a lot, um, the lactose in the milk solids is slightly caramelized. Mm -hmm. So it's not a caramel flavored milk yeah. chocolate, it's just slightly caramelized. And if you take that with caramelized hazelnuts, you get a big caramel flavor. Mm -hmm. But there's a herb and a fruit. In this right, one. okay, herb and a fruit so as well. This is a tough one, this is a tough one. So don't you don't have to get this one. No, okay. So see what okay. you think. Mm -hmm. Some people will get it, but... It's rare. Mm. With milk chocolate. Yeah, so that's a milk chocolate mm. curvature, that, that caramelized milk chocolate wow. curvature with a caramelized hazelnuts.
when this came about through we were we were nosing uh, lemongrass and yeah. tasting hazelnuts and it was a beautiful match yeah. um, but it, it also is a is a light herb so it's, yes. it's pulling up and there's yes. a wee touch of lime in there uh -huh. you know uh -huh. the lime is what gives it the um, that wee boost so it's not quite so heavy yeah um, that's all that's all I mean it's amazing how a chocolate does that to you it's know. all coming through now yeah. actually you know, this is like connecting with a whiskey. Yeah. Um, uh, a good friend of mine, uh, Charlie McLean, who I think you've worked with. That's right, yeah. A real oh, character. A amazing, yeah. amazing chap. And he may well see this, so I won't say too much. <laughs> um, but uh, just the way he describes the whiskey and the mm. tastes and the aftertaste and how long they last. We, we know we're talking about something very similar. There's a connection there. It is fascinating. You know, I've worked, and that's why I work, ended up working with Charlie, is because we were. Um, I often get asked by distillers to pair and mm. accentuate different notes. Mm. So if you're working with expressions, and well, Charlie, for example, you know, knows these expressions yeah. really, really well. Yeah. If you take um, a, a noser of chocolate, I guess is what you might call me, but <laughs> if you take these different curvatures or ganaches and you combine them, so you nose a whiskey and then you taste mm. a particular chocolate, you can do it badly as well and it has a really cheapening effect, mm. but if you do it really um, very carefully, when you come back to the whiskey again, it's completely changed, and it and it highlights those characteristics in the in the in the expression of the whiskey that are, are you would miss otherwise. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. and for Charlie and I, it was really exciting to yeah. do that. So. Well, Ian, that was absolutely lovely. Thank you very much indeed for that. Um, I'd actually like to just ask you a couple of questions. First of all, um, how did you become one of the world famous chocolatiers? I, well, I have to blame my father and my mother, probably. But uh, no, my, my, I was brought up on the west coast of Scotland, mm. uh, on the Isle of Mull, oh. uh, in Tobermory. Place I love. Did you know well? Yeah, yeah that's right. Um, just beautiful area. But um, my father was originally a sailor, but um, he did a lot of cooking and he had a real passion for um, using the best of Scottish ingredients, but mm. combining with the more exotic. He did a lot of um, Southern European, Southern, South American and Indian kind of cookery, uh, but right here in Scotland. Yeah. And so obviously he brought me up to, I'm not sure about how willingly work in the kitchen as well, but, yeah. um, but that gave me the exposure um, to that side of things. And so that's where I guess I'm, I enjoy working with really fantastic Scottish ingredients, but combining it with the more unusual. My mother is a perfectionist, mm -hmm. so I blame her for all of that <laughs> side of things. So my, my background is actually through um, uh, product design, actually engineer at Glasgow School of Art. So I, I, so, I always so you, were, loved you, you didn't go to a catering school? No, none of that. No, right. so it, that was more of a kind of the hobby yeah. side of it, whereas um, my, I was always interested in design and um, creative design, and, yeah. um, but also engineering. So I, I did a you know, combination. So I love the technical side and um, for ganaches, to do ganaches without all the additives yeah. is really technically difficult yes. um, and things don't always work. Yes. We are, however, 16 years later and it doesn't always work. <laughs> so um, then we have to eat them all. So um, give us a, give us a call. Somebody has to do. It. <laughs> yeah, somebody has to do. It. But um, you know, so it, it is technically very difficult, and that's not everybody's cup of tea. Some mm. people, you just want to make chocolate, nice, yummy thing. You know, if all you're trying to do is sell it to tourists, that's yeah. that's fine, and everyone will enjoy it. But if you're trying to do something without the additives, completely naturally, and have a world class texture or a really wonderful delicate flavors, and not to lose any of those um, flavors and textures, mm. that's where you have to have a scientific approach. So. Mm. In the kitchen, we work in that way. It's not like new flavor of the month. It's very much um, that dark velvet truffle received best dark truffle in the world. We've changed the recipe four or five times since then, just because you're constantly <coughs> realizing something you can do slightly better, something you can improve on. Yep. You can improve the balance. The because we're working with cream from a particular herd of cows, the weather changes. When it yes. does get sunny yes. for a couple of weeks in Scotland, yes. um, <laughs> no, the weather changes and um, we have to adjust the recipe. Uh, um, so where, where, is the, where do you um, get your milk from, your so cream? The, the cream is um, from a family dairy, the D&D &D dairies. It's, mm -hmm. cross, it's about two valleys over from here okay. um, uh -huh. in, uh, in Creef. Yeah. So it's, uh, and that was really interesting because you know, it could have been an unhealthy herd, it could have been a blended cream, but when you get it lucky and you find some really fantastic ingredients yeah. and, and you can use it in a way that you're going to taste them, that's yes. quite exciting. Yes. So. And a good Scottish product as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But it, I don't, I never would use Scottish ingredient just for the tartan yep. sake of it, yep. you know. It's because it's good. Yeah. You know, it's not a coincidence that, that I'm here in Scotland, you know. 
you can't grow cocoa anywhere in Europe, right? Yes. So you've yeah. got to bring in your cocoa beans. Uh-huh. But where do you find the best fruit farms? Yeah. I mean, this is called yeah. the fruit basket of yeah. Scotland. We export uh, raspberry canes down to Spain. You know, so the the fruit in here around here is incredible. Apiaries, there's apiaries up and down so, this valley. So I mean, just driving north and you see a chocolatier in the middle of the highlands, and thinking, what on earth? So the reason you're here for is, me is for the, a specific purpose. There's two sides to it. One is the fresh ingredients. You know, you've got um, you've got really good uh, fruit farms, apiaries, and cream. Mm-hmm. Uh, cream is probably the biggest thing, mm-hmm. um, and you you need a good fresh source um, for for those products. But the other side are the chefs. It just so happens that within about 50 miles of here, you have most of the Michelin star chefs in Scotland. So, <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, had I been on the Isle of Mull, it would have been harder, <laughs> a lot more difficult. Yeah. Um, to, to, to balance the books because you're spending this amount of time you're yeah. spending this um, 10 times more on ingredients it's going to cost more but but you um, you have a clientele that are really yeah. enjoying um, that um, it's not it's not about being elitist either it's yeah. not about this is for a Michelin chef and you and you, you can't enjoy it otherwise yeah. children enjoy this my, my 11 year old daughter enjoys it you know just it's the difference between oh yum what a a great chocolate compared to Oh my goodness! What yeah. is that? You know, yeah. that's that's the reaction you're after, yeah. which, which is just the reaction you had yeah, for me so with that first chocolate I tasted. Yeah. Wonderful, so, yeah. So, yeah. And uh, as in terms of the design, I, I notice you've got small designs on top of these chocolates. Mm. Who, who does? Who's who's the artist here? Is this, this go back to your school? Myself. You know, you're working on the shoulders of giants. So okay. there's a French designer I work mm. with um, who's done some of them. My wife. Um, oh, of course. And, and, and I see myself. some in the shop. There's some lovely paintings. Is, is she the yeah, artist? Yeah, she's she's the, she's the chocolate artist. painter and oil okay. painter. Fantastic. Yes, that's right. Um, so yeah, she's got um, some of that creativity. But also with the flavors, you're working. Fortunately, I'm working with um, you know chefs who have brilliant ideas, mm. and what's really lovely um, is that they are after what you do best. You right. know, so they don't come in wanting you to produce this, this, and this, and this for them. Mm. They come in saying, "Listen, I'm, I'm, I'm. My menu is this, or yeah. the expressions I'm using are this. Yeah. What can we create to go with it?" And they want the best of what you do. Yeah. So, so you come up with these wonderful ideas. Like, how do you come up with lemongrass and yeah. hazelnuts and so on? Yeah. You you share these ideas with each other and you generate new ones and that's that's what I mean by standing on the shoulders of giants it's it's not a, a one man band it's yeah. very much a, a sharing uh, I mean, how, how do, do you realize that you are as good as you are world renowned um, the awards say that that the truffles get it so yes the Saotomi Couverture is great those cows they deserve an award you know? <laughs> they're producing great cream and yeah. yes we spend the time yeah. you know so that and the goal is to strive for excellence yes. um, but I don't I never see it as like oh I'm there now you know, yeah. every week we have meetings in the kitchen, half an hour every week, talking about what went wrong. You yeah. know, yeah. what yeah. what we how we can improve and so on, because it yeah. doesn't always work, and um, and there's always something to learn. So it's 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 a it's an ongoing curve, yes. really. I know that uh, it was about seven years ago. I had two gentlemen who planned a trip to Scotland, and in the seven almost between seven and ten days, they said, "Could you please organise the tour around the Highland Chocolate?" Yeah. <laughs> which was quite bizarre, but at the same time, what a great trip we had. C- can you tell us of, uh, I mean, people come from far and wide all around the world to come and visit Dude, you here? That's right, we have a, um, a good cross section. There's obviously a lot of Scots uh, and English, um, but you have a lot of people coming in from North America, mm-hmm. so the US and Canada, um, uh, from Germany as well, Northern Europe, but yep. the Germans <coughs> also really, they love to understand. Yes. And, and so they get a lot out of it, because there's a lot to, um, to the, uh, the recipes and the methods mm. and so on, so they love that. Um, but it, o- across East Asia, I mean, we export all over the world, yeah. uh, even to Japan and uh, uh, East Asia and so on. So uh-huh. yeah, from all over. Yes, and you not worry about some of these people coming and stealing your recipes. Do you know? I could give you the recipe. You go home and you'd make it differently. You know. <laughs> um, you know, because it's not just about the ingredients in it; it's how yeah. you do it. It's the time. It's yeah. the texture. And as I'm just saying, 15 years on. Oh, 200 yep. recipes later, it it doesn't work one yeah. day, you yeah. know, and you have to adjust it and shift yeah. it. So yeah. it's very much a, um, a live procedure, yeah. if you want. The truffle you just tasted, yeah. if you come back in a couple of months, it'll be different, yeah. you know, um, just because either the cream will have shifted, the new harvest of the, of the cocoa okay. from Sao Tome, or um, we've come up with a better way. Yeah. Where's the passion? You, you need passion in this job, as, as in to be successful in almost any job. You need this passion. Where does that come from? Ah, there is a real satisfaction, um, and that probably that's one thing you see in all of the team I have in the yeah. kitchen. 
they all of them have something in common. They, they have an eye for detail. So they, they, they like working with something small and detailed. Um, but also there's the, the, the satisfaction they get from doing something really excellent. And so by the end of the week, I'm not the greatest at patting them on the back saying, well done. I'll notice when things aren't right. But so therefore, they have to be personally, and that's the way I am, personally, you know when you've done something well. And, yeah. and that is really satisfying. So you go home at the end of the week, and there's a reason why nobody else makes these velvet truffles. Yeah. They're really difficult yeah. and awkward. Yeah. So you need to have something to, you know, take you through the three times that it didn't work to get to the fourth time when you make it work, yes. you know? Yes. And that's that um, desire, I think, for, for um, the satisfaction from, yeah. from doing something as best as you can. Yeah. Next week, you might do it better. But yes. <laughs> well, Ian, this has been absolutely amazing. Thank you very much indeed. Thank um, you. This is Ian, Ian Burnett, of course, from the Highland Chocolatier. Uh, that has been divine. First thing in the morning, I never thought to myself I'd be having a breakfast and then eating chocolate. But uh, can I come and do this again sometime yes, but soon? <laughs> next time before breakfast. Okay? Before, oh, right. taste even, even better. More. Yeah. Okay, well, at least I did, I did the right thing and not having a coffee before. Yeah, then. absolutely. Perfect. Yeah. Marvellous. Well, thank you very much indeed. And uh, we're going to switch the camera off now because I'm going to finish these off. Thank you, <laughs> thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Namaste. Namaste.